Amen. So let's, okay, we're going to be, we're still in, where? Ruth chapter 1, okay? So we're going to continue from where we left off. And um, I've just spoken to Jong because um, just to make a, just a small request, that in light of what we're actually going to deal with um, in chapter 1 and chapter, okay, both chapter 1 and chapter 2, that whether if if it's all right with everyone, then what I'd like to do is to propose that the all the activities and all that we'll do it this afternoon, and then the singles and the couples sessions we'll have it tomorrow afternoon, so that we get some additional preaching and all that out of the way, which I think will help lay some more necessary groundwork that I think will be beneficial. That, that way, I think the, those sessions will be also more productive. So if it's all right with everyone, I, again, um, I, I don't want to dictate the thing, but if it's, it, you know, it's up to you, right? And church has liberty and autonomy to decide that. But uh, if you think that will help, right, this is my, my suggestion, that if we could do a swap, then I think uh, this, this will help us. Okay, so let's go back to Ruth chapter 1 and just... Just be, have a quick word of prayer here, Father. We just thank you for even helping us to get started this morning, and also for some others who have arrived. I pray, Lord, as we uh, continue w where we left off, that uh, in this time of uh, teaching and preaching, that Lord, you will um, be fruitful for us, and that you open our eyes of understanding. And Lord, continue to just uh, use me, fill me in thy spirit, that I may be of a help and blessing to everyone. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Christ's name. Pray, Amen. All right. Now, we're continuing from where we left off, and I, we were last in um, verse seven. All right, concerning Naomi and her decision. Um, some of you have been asking or been wondering over the last few days um, about how is it I'm able to kind of deal with the preaching the way I do. Now, I am not gifted with superior intellect or anything like that because otherwise, I, like I said, I will have a doctorate and I'll be writing books and papers. But um, it's just a very simple thing of, okay, it's a very simple trick. You do that when you go on vacation or when you go home. Okay, when you travel home from Siem Reap, you go back home, what happens? You know the place. You visited the place many, many times. Because you visited the place many times, after a while, you notice details. First, second, third time I, you know, I visited Siem Reap, I kind of just have an overall picture. But the more times I revisit what happens, I start to notice. Wait a minute, that place wasn't there. That restaurant wasn't there before. You know, something's changed in this place. Why? Because you are now familiar. And the more familiar you are. Okay, and plus, if you have an eye for noticing details, man, you can practice this all the time. Every morning, you notice what's different about your wife. Okay, try to pay attention. What's different about her, right? And if you do that, you're gonna start to notice. Oh wait, she did something to her hair. She did, you know, this and this, whatever. All right, and just don't say, uh, "Have you gained weight?" All right, then you're you're in trouble. Okay, so, but in noticing details. Things start to come out at you, okay, when you read the scriptures. That's why, as I mentioned, we read the genealogy, we don't notice that there were four women out of all the men that were mentioned there. And out of the four women, all of them are Gentiles. Then when you dig deeper, what happens? You find out all of them have a past. They have some sort of history, right? And I thank God that, there, you know, in the genealogy, that there were four bad girls that were mentioned there. Because I think if that's the case, that leaves a lot of hope for all of us, right? Boys and girls alike. And so, okay, so anyway, back to where we were. So what happens is this, uh, well, verse 7 says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Verse 8, right? And Naomi said unto her da two daughters, Go, return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and 
with me. Right? They have made the decision to return home. Now, notice, Naomi makes the decision. The two daughters-in-law are in total agreement. They all pack up, they get ready to go, and they begin that journey. And midway, what happens is this. Now, Naomi now has a change of heart. Right? She goes back. And then she says to the two daughters-in-law, says, you know what, why don't you return back to your mother's home? Right? Now, everyone who marries, the scripture tells us, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay? They're one flesh. So when, do, when does that one flesh cease? Upon death. Right? Upon that one, when one dies, the, the, you, you're no longer one flesh. But they cleave, right? They join. They, in that joining, you think of it as they super glue, God super glues these two people together. And because they're joined in that way, inseparable, understand the leaving of how father and mother is important. Many marriage problems arise because why? One or both, right, parties, the husband or, or, and or the wife, have not f really left father and mother. Okay? And it creates tremendous problems. Because why? They too become an independent unit that now form their own family and make their own decisions without outside influence. Now, can we seek godly counsel from parents? Yes. We honour father and mother, but let me remind everyone here that most Asians are confused about what it means to honour father and mother. When we honour father and mother, what happens now? The is reinterpreted to mean you obey them even though you are now an adult and that you have left father and mother and that you are now in your own home, own marriage, right? Make suppose you're supposed to make your own independent decisions, but what happens? You're still dependent on them to make the right choices. Okay? The problem with that is that you are not honouring father and mother. You are now mummy and daddy's boy. And the wife may be waking up to realise, oops, I married a boy, not a man. Okay, now, for Naomi's daughters-in-law, now that they are, okay, they are widows, Okay, they are also now independent. They are actually free to marry anybody they want. But they are, don't forget, they have already left father and mother. Now, she tells them, go back, all right? return to your mother's house. Now, she is grateful. She says, the Lord deal kindly with you as he have dealt with the dead and with me. All right? Now, she, is, she recognizes that what, they have been loyal to her. Okay? They are together with her. She knows, okay, they are also together with her. Why? Because in memory of the departed sons, right, their husbands who are no longer alive, but she says, you know, she understands, okay, maybe that's why you are with me. All right, it says, so you have dealt kindly with the dead, and then says, and with me. But she says, not necessary, go. Go home. Verse 9, she has. Okay, well wishes for them. She hopes for the best for them. She says, The Lord grant you that ye may find rest. Why? Because being a widow and being on your own is difficult. Right? It says, You can find rest, each of you, in the, notice, husband of her wife, uh, of her, sorry, in the house of her husband. He's saying, Go back to your mother's home. Right? I hope you'll find rest. How? Go find another husband. Start over again. And I wish you all the best. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, can I say this? She kissed all of them goodbye. She said her farewell. She said, I will continue this journey without you. All right, go back. Go back. But then they wept. Why? Of course, saying goodbye, parting is painful. But it is painful primarily because those bonds are very tight. They are a close family. 
Right? And realize this, family is important. When you have lost everything, you lost your income, you lost your job, you lost your dignity, and you lost all these things, you know, that, that's when you, you and I are going to realize you know, the only thing that is of value left is our family. And we've been, in, we've been neglecting that all this time. You know? We've been neglecting that. Why? Because we've been pursuing other things. But here she says, look, just go. All right? And so they lifted up their voice. This was a loud crying and wailing. And, but she sends them away. Now, she also says this. The reason, one of the reasons she said this was, you notice the way it was worded. It says, the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And there is, in Naomi's mind, there is this idea here that, you know, as long as you stick around with me, okay, you're not going to have a better future. You are going to go back to Israel as a foreigner in that country. And she understands this. Because why? Her sons had married contrary to the law of Moses. Okay? What's the possibility of these two young women getting, finding a husband in Israel? Next to zero. Not without some man deliberately disobeying the word of God. Okay? And she's saying, you know, if you follow me back to, back to Israel, to Judah, you're going to doom yourself. Okay? You are going to be stuck. And it's, I will become a liability to you. And guys, say this also many times when you and I are greatly discouraged, we have a tendency also to push the people closest to us away. We want to keep them away. We don't want them with us and whatever. And, you know, someone can become very fatalistic also to think, all right. I, Naomi, have gone through this. I come here, and what happens? Husband dies. All right? We, we, we thought we have a chance to turn this around. What happens? One son dies. Then the second one dies. Now we have this. Now we have nothing. And, you know, people can get this idea that maybe I'm just bad luck. If you stick around with me, bad things are going to happen to you. Go. While well, you still can. Get out. Fast. Sometimes we get the, uh, this idea, well, there's this thing happening in church, this thing happening in church, you know, maybe it's time for me to get out before something happens to me. What about maybe that the Lord is doing something there? That's why those things are happening. And so she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and they wept and they pleaded with her. All right, we see not only the parting with Naomi's daughters-in-law, but the pleading of Naomi's daughters-in-law. All right, verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They understand this, they say, we will go with you. Right, we'll go into a land that we do not know, a people that we do not know, but it is your people, and your people will go with you. But look at her, her reasoning, verse 11. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? What's the point? Right? Look, look at the reasoning. Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Now, I don't know about you, but when you look at the words that someone says, all right, in the case of Naomi, you start to get a picture that this person spiritually is not well. It's very clear. She's not doing well. She is pushing people away from her life. All right? The close, people who are closest to her, the ones who can be of a help and comfort to her, she doesn't want it. She wants it. It's like, just leave me. I want to be alone. I don't want anybody. Now, why is that the case? Think. She's hurting. She's hurting. And she hurts bad. It's hurting very badly. And many of us, what happens when we are like that? We just want to go off into a little corner all by ourselves. Or if you can, you want to curl up 
into just a little ball and you want to shut the whole world out. If there is a little room, that you, a dark room that you can go into, you just want to lock the door, go in there and you don't want to come out. And she's in pain. Hurting people very often want to be alone. Hurting people also sometimes have a need to hurt others. Okay? In church ministry, one of the things I recognized was, I tell it to people this way, how do you deal with someone like that? I said, it's like loving a porcupine. Why? You have to do it very carefully, otherwise you could get hurt. But the porcupine gets very prickly because why? It's to protect the soft, very vulnerable inside. And sometimes the hardest, the people who are hardest on the outside are really crying out inside. They need a friend, they need brethren, they need God. But they want to be away and they want to be alone. Right? And here, the daughters pleaded with her, said, you know, of course we will go, we will return with you. Right? And we'll go with you to your, your people. Why? Because they have already accepted that we are part of your family. Wow. Do you see the commitment? All right. Now, they did not grow up with her. They did not grow up in that home. But you know something? You, do you realize that you can be a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law and be as close as family as if you grew up in there and to be of a help? And the day will come that maybe father or mother or, uh, or in-law right, may not be doing well and they need you most. And here, but I want to see here this unhealthy thinking because she's not doing well. And because someone's not doing well, one of the areas that happens will be affected first will be the heart. When the heart is not well, the thinking is not straight. Right? It's fatalistic, it's pessimistic. Now she's despairing because from her words you see here that things will not get better. Okay? Now Peter, when writing uh, to, in his episode, he did tell us that, you know, that we are, even though we are in manifold temptations or trials, tr right? But it, says, it tells us that it's for a season. Why? Seasons come, seasons go. Okay? Seasons come and seasons go. We have very bad haze right now, but it's going to end eventually because why? The rainy season is going to come soon. Okay? That's why they want to do all the burning and clearing before the rainy season so that they can plant and then after that the rains will come. Alright? But you realize this each and every one of us, whatever painful episode that you're going through, there is a season it will pass and something else will come along. And as a church, as we pass through those trials or whatever, um, that peaceful period, we ought to remember it's a time to prepare for the next difficult season because it will come. And life goes in cycles. But here, she's saying it's not going to get better. She's feeling worthless. Right? desires to be alone and she feels that you know what God is unable and powerless and there's nothing that he can do now look at her words she says are yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands now what she's saying okay you're gonna stick with me realize this you're ch okay she's inferring from this the chances of her of these two women finding a new husband are next to zero in Israel this, if you expect me to provide a husband, what are the chances of that? Can she bear more sons? Basically, what she's saying, do you think I can bear more sons? All right, what are the odds of me getting married at my age? All right, Naomi. All right, she's had two grown up sons. What do you, what, I mean, can you try to guess how old she is now? At the youngest, she's in her 40s. And she's thinking, no, not, okay, okay mid-40s or so. Also. She's prob probably thinking, no way, Jose. It's not going to happen. 
And so you see this very negative kind of talking. I don't believe being positive for positive sake. Okay? But I do believe one thing that uh, we are positive because we our hope is in Christ. Right? And that the grace of God is not limited by circumstances and even all the evil in this world. And that God is able to do things beyond our ability to even comprehend or imagine. But for her, this is a dead end. All right? And so she's saying, don't come with me and follow me into the dead end because this is not good for you. Go home. You go home, you have a chance of finding the love and peace and rest and get on with your lives when you get a husband. You stick with me, you're doomed. So she pushes them away. Right? We see the pushing away by Naomi. Verse 12 says, Turn again, my daughters, go your way. Right? Go away. For I'm too old to have a husband. You see? She's saying, look, it's impossible. No way. And because she says, yeah, I'm too old to have a husband, she's saying, look, there's no hope. It's not going to happen. If I should say I have hope, right? If I should have a husband also tonight and should bear and, and should also bear sons, right? Verse 13, Jesus says, Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Will ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters. Okay? She is seeing there is absolutely no possibility of this ever happening. Right? She's old. To her, by the way, Naomi is single again. But now she's old. Now, years back, someone actually said this, all right, bumped into someone, uh, someone actually bumped into somebody else who had left church. And then she said this, you know, when I was young and I was in this church, you know, the missionary, all that told me, you know, if you serve God faithfully, if you do this, you do that, you know, God will bless you and God will give you someone in your life and whatever, and you will get married. And, says, and you know, I believe all that. I said, and now I'm old. I don't know, somewhere in the late 30s. And he says, nobody wants me. And basically he's saying, Someone lied to me. I didn't get what I wanted. And that's why I'm no longer in church. Now, can I point out something? Life, no matter who you are, in your life, it's a matter of time before there will be very bitter and painful disappointments. It's going to happen. But can I point out also that there is a moving on and there will be other things that will also bring laughter and joy to our lives but there will also be painful things and it will all it's just part of life it's going to happen to every single one of us okay but sometimes in the pain and the um, that we are going through we are unable to see any way forward at all Okay, that's in our human tendency. And she's saying here, there's no way. Okay, I'm too old to have a husband. How do you know? Okay, I know some, uh, I'm speaking some here, that I, and this, I, I know potentially I'm going to get myself into trouble because this is a sensitive topic, especially with those who are single. But years back, I remember this. This man who I met, Okay, and he was in his early 30s and he was newly wed and I found out his wife was 43. Uh, so I was of course curious. I asked him, he was a faithful man, right? missions director in his church. He teaches the Bible Institute. Right? He runs a, a business of his own. So that allows him to have free time to actually teach in the Bible Institute in the afternoon to train the men to help his pastor. And I asked the so I asked, I said, tell me your story. How did, what happened? And he told me, he says, well, he had been praying for one at a time for a particular lady in the church. 
He prayed, he says, but each time, it never, after two weeks, he had no more conviction from the Holy Spirit to keep continue praying anymore. He realized, no. Finally, there was this lady, and he prayed. And after two weeks, he continued praying, and continued praying for six months. Now he knows in his eyes and in her eyes, this is impossible. Okay, it's a much younger man. It's probably about a 10 year gap. Finally, he prayed and prayed after six months, plucked up the courage after church on Sunday, I think it was the evening service, went across, talked to her and asked her to marry him. Imagine what's going on, her reaction, because to her, it's like, is this a joke? Are you trying to make fun of me or what? What are you trying to do? All right, I asked her, what was your reaction? She, she was afraid. And he assured her and assured her and explained everything to her and finally she said yes. Okay? They sat there in the back of the pastor's car while they explained what happened to me. And what an amazing story. Why? For someone now on in practical terms, what happens? In the world that we live in, even in, uh, uh, in our church culture, many times we think someone who is of that age, you know what? Expiry date has passed. Okay? But here was someone who was praying for the leading of the Lord. Who, in, in directing in all these matters, doesn't care about our norms. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah? Now, she said this she's too old to marry, remarry. She is too old to have old to have children, right? And he says, even if I he says, if if I should say I have hope, right? He says, if I should have a husband also tonight, and to and then he says and should also bear sons. He says even if I got married and then tonight we have our wedding night, whatever, and then he says you know she she's, she bears sons. He says this is not going to work. Right? It says they will have to what? Wait for the sons to grow up to be men. And basically she's saying this is too much to hope for. This is such a long shot. It's not going to happen. And I want to note here that we have a tendency of limiting God. We expect God to work only in the way we think things can work. Right? Only in a way that we can understand. Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6 says what? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Do you realize that? With all thine heart. What does that mean? Even when things don't look possible. With all thine heart. Even if the circumstances don't seem to be favorable. Even if it doesn't make sense. Trust Him with all thine heart and lean not onto thine own understanding. Don't try to figure it out for on his behalf because he is far wiser than you and I. Amen. And can I say this? The, the times that I tried to figure it out, I got myself into, the, into trouble. How? For trying to work out God's will for, on my own. Even when you know the direction, if you try to figure it out and try to work it out on your own, you could get yourself into serious trouble. That's why it says, in all thy ways, right? Now this, what you do. What's the next step to take? In all thy ways, acknowledge him, right? And he shall direct thy paths, the path you take. And by the way, the path you take is not necessarily a straight path. The path that he, can, he will direct you may be requiring you to take some turns. And it may be a bit inconvenient at times. But if it's his path, that's what matters. Amen. You get what I'm saying here? Because we are so fixed on the destination, we always expect a straight path. And that's where sometimes circumstances fool us because what looks like a clear path may not be his path. Okay? Remember, because the journey is what he's going to use to shape us and mold us so that we will be the right person to arrive there. If that's the case, if, even if it zigzags, 
realize his path is what matters, not whether I can figure out a straight path. Right? So we have to trust the Lord with all our hearts. Now, Ruth, back in chapter 1, verse 13, now she's saying, look, this is too much to expect. Right? She cannot expect Ophrah and Ruth to patiently wait for these supposed sons of her to be born so that they can marry them. Verse 13, she asks the question, okay, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? How long does it, is it going to take? In today, maybe 20 years or more. All right? So Ruth and Ophra, if they're going to wait 20 years or more, how old would they be? Assuming that they, they, they were young and whatever, they might be already in their 40s. Or is it, are you going to wait? You think you can wait that long? 20 years? Ladies, you're single today. Do you think you can wait another 20 years? All right, now, now understand that she's, she's trying to reason this, right? And of course, this is human reasoning and, and logic. But underlying this, the problem is in that kind of reasoning is this. She's assumed there's only one way for God to work. You see what I'm saying here? And we can work ourselves, you and I can work ourselves into a corner by assuming that that's the only way God can work. And because of that, our conclusion is it's not possible. Years back, this was one of the things that happened because um, there we were, my pastor and I, and we were burdened about the finances of the church. And you know, one, it was one of those times we just got on our knees and we're praying and we're asking the Lord to provide. Okay? And all that time, we have, uh, what we were asking for was this, Lord, you have to increase the giving right, so that we will have more, so that we, uh, we, we, have to, we will be able to either stay in the place that we are, uh, we're currently renting. And there was a possibility that the rent was going to go up. So that's why we were praying. And you know something? What happened in the answer to prayer was a very gentle rebuke. You know how the Lord answered that? Remember, we're on our knees, we're asking, Lord, you have to give, you have to help give grace to everyone so that they can give more. Alright? So that we will have more, so that we can meet those needs. And what happened was this. The door opened. We had got an invitation from a ministry. They have a big hall that they wanted to rent to us at a much lower price than what we were paying. And you know how the Lord answered? He lowered the expenses instead of increased the giving. And then, why was that a rebuke to me? Because I realized we've been telling him how to f solve the problem. You see what I'm saying here? We've been dictating to him how he should solve the problem when there was more than one way. Even if you and I cannot figure it out, there is more than one way to deal with this. Okay? And Naomi now works herself into the corner because she's saying, look, Says, are you all going to wait until they're grown up? Says, are you going to okay? Would you stay? Will you stay on and wait? All right. Is it would ye stay for them from having husbands? Now, those will you stay, remain single while waiting for these sons to grow up? Says, nay, my daughters. Says, no. Is it rhetorical? These are rhetorical questions. She's saying, you know the answer. Right? It's not going to happen. Then it says, it, for it grieveth me. Now, now she's coming, now she's really sh showing what's deep inside. For it grieveth me much for your sakes. It says that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. It says, she's telling the, the daughters, do you know why all this is happening? God's hand is against me God is opposed to me everything that happened it's his fault alright 
And so all this stuff now, it's happening to her. All right, it's unfortunate she is grieved at all this it's happened to, that's happened to her life. She's grieved also for their sakes. And here's the thing, because we get to the point where some of us will conclude, you know what? It's his fault, God's fault. That's why this happened. All right? It says here, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. God is against me. He is opposing me. He won't let me have what I want. All right? He took away everything that's important to me. Can I ask everyone here, how many of you, if you were to be honest, all right, I'm not asking you to raise your hands, but just check yourself. How many of you have been there? We've been there. All right? And if we're honest, we were angry at him for allowing this to happen. Isn't it? And in our pain, deep down, we blame him for it. His hand is against me. Everything I try to do, God stands in opposition. And she's right. She says, I'm grieved deep at heart. You know, for years, we, because of things that, in fact, uh, because of personal ignorance, and then also because of the influence of culture, and then because of things that were not taught in our church, not the church that I'm in right now, but previously, I had, in the early years of our marriage, right, my wife and I concluded, okay, it's okay, I'm not ready to have kids. Me. Okay, we had cats. Okay, we are kind of like our kids. Fur babies. And, but there was a point when my wife said, you know, we need to consider this, it's time. I recognize, okay, every woman, that the, there is a biological clock that's ticking, and sometimes the, there's a point when the alarm goes off and says, it's time. Okay, I opened myself to that. I said, okay, let's, let's, let's try. It happens, it happens, it doesn't, fine. Now, we had actually two pregnancies before our eldest, Amy, was born. As soon as we tested positive and you know we confirmed that we we're going to have a baby, within a week it was over. Now can I say this? No, within that one week, there are a lot of things that changes and all that that go on inside you. Lo that one week was long enough for me to accept and to know we're having a baby and I'm going to be a dad. And then for it to be taken away. Okay. Now by that time, after the second one, man, my fist was up in the air. Okay. Why? What kind of sick joke is this? You give us something to take it away. What are you trying to do? Now, it wasn't until the 19th of November, 1999, okay, and the Lord broke me in that day. I won't elaborate all the details just yet. But I realized that I had been on the throne. And if you want to know how sovereign God is and how small we are try having a baby try having a baby when you have difficulty conceiving when there is nothing medically wrong with any either of you 
And the two failed pregnancies are proof that we know what we're doing. There is no reason at all other than that the Lord had sovereignly decided when to open the womb and when to close it. And all those years when I was saying, now's not the time. Now's not the time. How arrogant we were, thinking that we were the ones in control. You want to know how helpless you are? Try being childless. Okay? The father and mother of John the Baptist. Abraham and his wife. All their lives. And you, God can use that to bring you to your knees until you realize how weak, how helpless, there's nothing you can do. Okay, with so another family, what happened was they were generally fine, faithful, serving the Lord, but you know, it's very painful for the husband because every month when your wife right, has a monthly cycle and she knows we are not having a baby. And to deal with the heartbreak. Do you see how in all this that there is a God who is sovereign and He alone can open or close the womb even when there is no f physiological, medical, psychological, emotional reason at all for why we are not going to have a baby. And I, for me, this is very personal because I understood when my fist was up there, it was like I realized, I said that the hand of God, the Lord has gone against me. Why? And the Lord had to work a series of events to break me. Finally to understand that I would trust you, Lord, no matter what happens. All right? Now, she sends them away on that note, right? That God is against me, right? Everything here that has happened up to this point is His fault. Verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again. Probably because it's like, why is all this happening to us? All right, poor old me. Poor us. And you see, there were two decisions that were made that day. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. Goodbye. She went home. All right, she's going to move back home to her mother Right, seek a better future for herself. Hopefully, remarry. But Ruth clave onto her. Ruth decided, I'm going to stick on with Naomi. Now we'll see the profession of Ruth's loyalty. Right, verse. 15. Naomi says this, and she said, "Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back onto her people." And then notice this, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Follow her. Go. All right? Ruth's instruction was what? Return to your parents. You're no longer part of this family. All right? Return to your gods. You're not in this faith. Then she tells Ruth, Naomi, Ophrah had already left. Right? It's long gone by this time. Why don't you go? Now, in every situation, realize there is a choice that we have to make. Right? And even as we make the choice and we will commit, right, and we we'll stick with our loyalty and our commitment, whatever, it realize this is not always going to be a comfortable decision. It may be a difficult decision. But speaking to the couples here. When you and I make those wedding vows, what do we say? For better 
or for poorer, for richer, right? Oh, sorry, for, for richer, for poorer, right? Better or worse, in sickness, in health, till death do us part. Regardless of the situation, what, what do we do? We're going to stick together. I would add, regardless of the situation, what do we do? Family, we stick together as family. As a church family, we stick together. Alright? And Ruth says this, this is now her, her confession, I would consider this her confession of faith also. She says this in verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. Right? This is, she, she tells Naomi, stop. Right? Don't make me leave you. Right? Or to stop following you. Why? For whither thou goest, I will go. Where will you go? I'll follow. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Never mind that it is not five star, right? Or three stars even. No matter how bad it is, wherever you live, I'll be there. Then she says, Thy people shall be my people. It's a choice. She is not Hebrew by birth, right? And thy God. My God. Now she has, by this time, forsaken, in declaring this, she has forsaken all other gods but the God of Israel. She's put a faith in Him. Right? She says, Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. Okay? She, her commitment is, even when she dies, she will be buried there. She's not going to be they're not going to take her body, bring it back to Moab and bury her there. She says, this will be my home. The Lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and me. All right? She has made the choice to follow the God of Israel. And so this is a profession of faith despite the difficult circumstances. All right? And that you live together as family members is a, and it is a choice and a commitment, by the way, that you and I make. Now, how do you know that your wife loves you? I'll tell you how. She is free to leave you anytime, any day, even right now. But she chooses not to. She chooses not to. She chooses to remain. You can chain her to the home. Right, you can handcuff her, you can chain her to the furniture. That won't prove a single thing. It's only when she has the full right and freedom to leave any time, but she continues to stay. And by the way, we make that commitment every day. Not just at a one-time vow. We make that commitment every day. We defend that every day. Now, this is not just in, in the case of uh, okay, mother-in-law and, and daughter-in-law. Realize this is true. This can be true of many relationships, family. As a church. Okay? The problem that is very often is that church has become more like a hotel. People check in and they check out. They check in and check out. I recognize the day will come that the Lord will move us to somewhere else. All right? The church that I join will not be the may not likely be the church I die in. The Lord will move us on, but understand this. Commit that I will be here faithful. I will stick with my commitments until such time that the Lord will move me. Amen. And not earlier than that. Why? Because we're family. And so she's saying here, look, she's going to be buried in Israel. 
not cremated or whatever like a pagan okay she is now there is a picture here that that is very similar to the New Testament church because here is a Gentile woman or Gentile bride okay who is now married okay oh you can see, right? Mary, uh, the, the, the New Testament church is a Gentile bride who is married to a Jewish husband. She becomes Jewish, right? She, she adopts everything. She becomes part of that family. And, and here it says, all, all the way even to death. Okay, Ruth makes that commitment. It says, I okay, have now, I will follow, I have put my faith and trust in the God of Israel. All the way to death, I will be buried there. Adopted. Okay? Just as everyone who is saved were adopted into the family of God. And by the way, the rules of adopt the law concerning adoption means the father who adopts you as their child cannot revoke that. Okay, you cannot say no more. I don't like you anymore. Bye bye. You cannot revoke that. And I want to see that throughout there are going to be these little pictures of salvation also that we're going to see and of redemption. Now, Ruth says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm sticking with you all the way. Right? So what happens? Naomi decided, okay, I'm going to stop trying to persuade her. When she verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking onto her. It's like, okay, we're just not we're not going to debate about this anymore. Let's go. So now I'm going to want to see here that we move to the next verse in verse 19. All right, they make the journey back. And the person that goes back to Israel is a different person. And we're now introduced to the personality of Mara. First thing we see here, people took notice of them. Verse 19. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? Right? They took notice. These two women had come back to Bethlehem. Right? And one of the things that they noticed was this. They recognized she's Naomi, but they are puzzled. It's like, looks like her, but we're not sure. Right? There's a part of her that's now, notice, unrecognizable. Why? The changes were written on her face. Okay? Now, ladies, you're going to realize that there are things that you can never erase away with makeup. When your joy is gone, okay, and when that smile is gone, and that smile, one of the things for me personally that I think that captivates me the most is that the smile, very often, those who can do it, the smile is not just here. People, I, there are people who have the amazing ability to smile with their eyes. And you can see it. And what they saw in Naomi was something's happened. And people are talking. All right. They notice it's changed her. They took notice of them. Naomi confirmed to everyone she had changed. Look at verse 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. Why? Look at the word for again, right? Why? Because. Because the Almighty had dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord had brought me home again empty. Why call ye, call me, uh, call ye me Naomi, seeing that the Lord had testified against me, and the Lord had afflicted me? Don't you ever dare call me Naomi again. This is my new name, Mara. It means bitter. Call me that. 
Why? He says, the Almighty God had dealt bitterly with me. She blamed God for bringing everything to a life. He says, you know what? He's the Almighty God. He's so sovereign. He is so powerful. And I am just so weak and puny. But He stomped on me. He squished me. He brought all these things into my life. And I am a victim and he is an unjust bully. Dealt very bitterly with me. He said, I went out full. We had everything and we left. Why? Because they wanted to protect everything that they had. But do you realize here that you and I cannot protect all that we have except the Lord keep and watch over those things? Psalm 127. Unless he keeps that, it says, and, and, says, and the Lord had brought me home again empty. Why does she say that? He took everything away from me while we were there. He's forced me back. So why call me Naomi? Right? Pleasant, delight, right? Delightful. He says, I'm not that. I am not that person. says, don't you see? This, the Lord had testified against me. The Almighty had afflicted me, brought all this upon me. He's robbed, he's saying, she's saying, he's robbed her of everything that's good in her life, everything that's mattered, mattered to her. And one of the things, I, you, you probably, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I, because I see this very often, is, here she comes back and everyone's like, what happened to you? What happened? Where, were you? Where have you been? Naomi, what happened? How, why is it you look so different? And people are asking a lot of stupid questions. And the more questions they ask, the more bitter she has become. Oh, by the way, we do that. Oh, I have not seen you in church for so long. You know what happened? Huh? What's been going on? How, how come, why haven't we seen you for so long? What, what about just saying, you know what? Glad to see you back. Good to see you again. Come, sit down. Let's. And she's bitter. She's annoyed. Now, she recognizes the problem. She says, I'm a bitter person. I know. Don't tell me about it. I know. I am bitter. Call me Mara. So? Hmm? You're not happy with that? I'm bitter. So what? What's it to you now? Alright? But I want us to realize here the first step to dealing with the problem is you need to recognize that you have that problem. And this is who or what you are right now. In Naomi's case, that she has become a bitter person. The things that have happened have changed her. Realize this. You and I actually have a choice about our reaction. God cannot, okay, there is nowhere in Scripture that God promises that no bad things will happen to you and I. I say this even to the New West. Right up to the third trimester, sometimes there's always going to be a possibility something can happen. But I have come to learn the hard way and to recognize that when those things happen the Lord is not doing things to us but He's allowing the things that may have happened to us so that He can work on us provided we are willing to cooperate with Him okay and you and I will have to make a choice as to whether that fist is up in the air or that our hands are held up, offered to Him while our knees are on the ground. Our knees are there in prayer, in submission. It's your choice. Okay? But she recognized that, okay, she is a bitter person, but I want us to note one more thing here. While all those questions were being fielded and she's saying these things, who was standing beside her? Ruth. 
Think about this. Try to picture this, right? Ruth is standing beside Naomi and she says, I came back with nothing. This is nothing. It means nothing to me. I came back empty. What is this person then? The one, now remember, the one who has chosen and decided that she will leave everything, her home, her people, right, her country, to come to be with Naomi, to weather every possible storm, and to live with her to death. And she says, you know what? I have nothing. Can you also see the blindness when you and I are in that situation that we can become so blind that we can no longer see the blessings of God? Do you realize how much of a blessing it is that when we go through our most painful and difficult times that there is a friend that God has given to us someone who will walk with us during those times. Hmm? But she cannot see it. She said, I went there full, I came back with nothing. I'm empty. And Ruth is right next to her. You and I know, if you, if you were Ruth in that situation, you know what? Thanks a lot. I'm done. You realize that? Many of us will say, that's it. What, what kind of mother-in-law is that? Okay? But, you see here, Ruth made a choice and she was going to stick with it. Right? When we fix on our circumstances, pain blinds us to the blessings that are all around. Right? This is how Naomi repays Ruth's loyalty and friendship. As if it means nothing. But they return under those circumstances. But because Ruth makes a decision to continue, all right, to stick with her mother-in-law, now, now you have the starting point where God can use her to do something. Verse 22, says, So Naomi returned and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And notice this, And they came to Bethlehem, in the beginning of barley harvest. Now, as we kind of wrap things up here, okay, I want us to consider some things. How did you and I go off course? How did you and I get derailed and somehow we're no longer where we're supposed to be in the center of God's plan? How did you and I kind of just go off? It's usually in small gradual steps. One thing leads to another. In Naomi's family's case, it was what? Deciding by sight, not by faith. They saw the famine, right? It's a difficult time. Their conclusion is, God obviously wants us to move to another country, to Moab. That's why we don't lean to our own understanding. Oh, wait, wait, hang on. Yes, maybe you're not going to move to a pagan country. How many who are single have made that conclusion before? Well, obviously I look around, there's no one, no guy. Obviously God's will for me is to be single. You came to that conclusion entirely based on the circumstances and, and like Naomi, you figured, well, there's no way any of this is going to work out. So therefore, this must be the inevitable. You really didn't search that out. Or you didn't even have to do much searching to come to that conclusion. But you see, we, we do that and dress it up to look very spiritual. And yet, there are times the ones who say that are hurting inside. Right? They moved, and in moving, moving, they moved away from God's will for their lives. Okay? 
Naomi's family moved from the place of God's blessing and instruction to a place where there was none. Moved away from the fellowship with God's people, right? The fellowship with the sheep. I'm not talking about the, the, those in sheep's clothing. Right? Fellowship with the sheep, but they moved away. Moved the, towards the world and away from God and God's people. And you will notice something. The bitterness is that of someone who has been on the losing end while wrestling with God. Pride, our hurt, and our anger will never allow us to admit that we're not right with God. Okay? And now, they'll move back. Was it the right decision? Yes, it was. Even if it was for the wrong reasons at that point. Why did they move back? There's bread in Israel. It's time to go home. That is still our home, but there's bread there. Right? The situ situation has improved. It's no longer the way it was. Right? And notice, they, they were, so they were going to do that. There's concerns how they were going to make a living and their prospects. But even sometimes, you can see here, Naomi makes that move for the wrong reasons. But she's going to the right place. To the right place. The key thing is you have to make sure you are going to the right place. Why? Because it is in the right place. Right? It is in the right church. That no matter who who or what our situation may be. God can now begin the work of rebuilding, repairing, and putting things back together. And the thing is this, until you and I find ourselves back in the right place, where God can take over and do that work, okay, whatever's broken can't be, can't be fixed very easily. Right. All those years, I at that time. This was uh, in the year two thousand when I I, all the, I thought all that time the Lord had brought my wife and I over to the Californian West Coast to fulfill a lifelong dream that I would finally be able to work in Silicon Valley alongside with the best. I was aiming for that. I never saw until that evening, Sunday evening, when we're preaching through the life of Jacob, that I realized the Lord brought us there, allowed us to be there, so that we will be planted in the right church. Why? He was fixing the things that were broken in our marriage. In my marriage. He was fixing the things that were broken in me. Because if he did not do that, right? Remember, we've been wanting to have a child. If we had a child at that time, our marriage would not have survived. We lost two. But imagine if we actually had two. Our marriage would not have survived. We were in the right church, right? where the pastor was then able to lay down a biblical foundation. It was there that I settled the issue of who and what is my, the final authority. And I settled the issue, even though, although I was saved, I settled the issue of the Lordship of Christ in my life, that He is Lord. Okay? Without all those things happening, right? Having a child was premature. I can see that now in hindsight. Not only that, surrendering and going to the ministry would have been disastrous. I would have been the worst possible pastor to, you know, to ordain. There were necessary things to put in place, but you have to first allow God to put us in the right place Anchor us there, 
right? So that there will be a period of growth and maturing, right? Before anything else can happen. Now, can I say this especially to the men? Please, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying here because we can get so impatient because we get caught up with the destination. We know. I have had to learn patience the hard way and believe me, Hebrews 12 describes it as the scourging, the chastisement and the scourging of the Lord. No, I have the scars. I will never forget those lessons. But I can still recall the pain, the pain of those lessons. But, so the thing is this, He doesn't need your help. He just needs our obedience. He just needs us to follow Him as He lays out the path. Right? But we have to quit fighting about I need that to get to that destination. I need to get to that destination. And sometimes if your wife is wrestling with you about it, realize this, it's not because she's out there to oppose you. She's telling you something here that you may be, this may be more about us and about where the Lord is leading. Because if this was the direction, it will be confirmed in both of you. Your, your wife will be on your side. Right? Same thing, likewise, the other way around. Your husband will be on your side. And, but I, I hope and I pray that you and I will recognize, okay, where are we right now? And if the Lord has brought us to here, I don't know, maybe Siem Rip, realize what the question we must be asking is, Lord, what was your purpose in bringing me here? Then the second question will be, Lord, is your purpose fulfilled? If not, then give me grace and wisdom to recognize that I need to stay on until that purpose is fulfilled. All right? If that purpose is fulfilled, then fine. Where to next? But notice, Ruth's commitment was what? She was going to go with Naomi and she's going to stay there no matter what, until she dies. Nothing is going to shake her, nothing is, to move her, is going to move her. But realize this, when in chapter 1, Naomi is also a picture of a believer who is out of the will of God. That road is painful. And is full of bitterness. And you can see in her words, right? I highlighted the way she said certain things. There was a constant wrestling with God. In particular, over who is in control. And then when it did not work out and whatever, the blame was assigned to him. Okay? Now as you as we wrap up this chapter here, I want us to see. There are some of us here today, maybe that we are in that situation. Maybe we see ourselves that, Naomi, that's me. Okay? Now, as we begin this camp, I want to challenge everyone, right? Be honest with God. That if this is happening, will you admit to Him, yes, I see myself there. I see this is what I've been doing, Lord. Only Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm sorry that I've been wrestling with you. Okay? Then will you allow him to take us to the next step? Where he will be the one. He will be the one who will have full permission to direct us as to what needs to be done next. Now realize this Naomi and her family. When they moved over, now it was with the best of intentions. Correct? No one is going to fault you about wanting to provide for your family and to take care of them, of their needs. It was with the best of intentions, but it was very ill-conceived. Why? Because God will never have approved that plan. Which is why, you see, it's so painful sometimes because... Um, 
I tell the members, look, you don't need my permission to do to make decisions in life. But I think you will want to seek out my counsel and, and the counsel of others before you make a choice. Which is why so many times the pastor is the last to know. Because we may have already made our choice. I'm just merely informing you, pastor, but I'm not seeking your counsel because I don't want you to tell me anything different from what I have already decided. Okay? You see how important it is that the scriptures tells us that the pastor cannot be a self-willed person. Why? Because if I'm self-willed, how am I going to counsel or tell somebody else about their self-will because I'm that way too. If I have no victory in that area, how am I going to be of a help to others? All right? How can you, for instance, maybe some of you hear that you are seeking the Lord's will about being in the ministry and, and being in the pastoral ministry and all that. How can you be the pastor when you are a self-willed person? That you are someone like Naomi, constantly wrestling with God to the point of frustration and even blaming God when things don't go our way. Do you see something wrong with that? So, as we wrap up here, let me just challenge everyone. Okay, it's very simple. If this is where you are, admit it. Admit that you have a problem to God. Confess that. And then pray and ask and plead for His mercy and grace and forgiveness that He can reset everything. Alright? And then let me challenge you to throughout this camp that you will turn to the Lord to seek Him that I want to start over again the right way. The move to Israel together with Ruth is a new beginning is the end of a chapter, of a very painful chapter in Moab. Okay? It is the beginning of something new. But at the end of chapter 1, you, what you see here with Naomi is this. It's very hard for her to see how things could get better. Maybe someone here today, you are at the bottom of a well of a deep dark well and you know you can't see anything there's no light okay okay I encourage you it can and will get better but you're going to have to trust the Lord not your own understanding alright so will you yield yourselves alright like this is just prep for the camp alright preparation of the heart will you yield yourself are you prepared you can hear all everything but still stay like a rock. Alright. Will you come? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, for your word, for challenging us. And Lord, these are many very difficult, painful things, matters of the heart that we have to examine ourselves and deal with. And I pray and ask that our hearts are yielded and that we will be willing to respond and that we will let you have your way. Give us grace. Give us courage. Most of all, honesty to admit and to get things right with you. And we thank you for what you're about to do. Thank you for even your word that was declared. And we ask this in Christ's name and pray.